Good evening, and thank you so much. I'm just always honored when, when people give me a bit of their time, because I know time's the most precious thing that you have, and we're all running out, of, we're all stretched in different kind of ways, but I just, I thank you for the gift of your time, and, and I pray that the Lord will work in me and through me so that, so that that gift will be rewarded. Every time I teach, I, I open with two ancient prayers, and, and I would like to begin with that this evening. Prayer by St. Ignatius and the other by St. Anselm. Self-offering, us offering ourselves. Take, Lord, all my liberty. And, and if you would, just say, say the prayer along with me. Take, Lord, all my liberty. Receive my memory, my understanding, my whole will. Whatever I have and possess, you've given to me. To you I restore it wholly, and to your will I utterly surrender it for my direction. Give me the love of you only with your grace, and I'm rich enough. Nor do I ask anything besides. And then searching for God, which is what we're all about. It's surely what where Joshua and, and all the folks in that day and time were. Oh, Lord, my God, teach my heart this day where and how to see you, where and how to, to find you. You've made me and remade me, and you've bestowed on me all the good things I possess. And still, I, I do not know you. I've not yet done that for which I was made. Teach me to, to seek you. For I cannot seek you unless you teach me, or find you unless you show yourself to me. Let me seek you in my desire. Let me desire you in my seeking. Let me find you by loving you. Let me love you when I find you. Praise God. So let's talk a bit about about Joshua. Joshua was one of those bridge people in scriptures. He's one that if there wasn't a book named by him, named for him, I, I doubt that many people would know anything about it. The last Grace Time service this past Saturday night, I preached on Joshua, and, and we, began the, <coughs> we began the teaching, or that, that service, by singing a great old gospel, gospel hymn, Joshua Fit the Battle of Jericho, and, and everybody just started singing right along with it. It was amazing. But what it showed me and, and helped me to understand was I think you could put a period at the end of that song because most folks think that Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, but they don't know, they don't know anything else about him. And I suspect that's because he was in the shadow of, of Moses, that, that great figure that clouds over the whole early part of, of the Old Testament. And we just don't think about the man who came after him. It's, it'd be like, who was it that followed Abraham Lincoln? Who was the next president there? Who, who followed? Who was the next prime minister after Churchill? See, those, those personalities are so huge that the next person is, kind of can get lost in the shadows very, very quickly. But what we'll see as we move through the study of this book, and, and the book's basically all, it's all about battles. It's about the conquest and the settling of the, of the promised land. And what we'll see is that, is that Joshua was one of the greatest military leaders of all time, and that's because God was leading him. He trusted in the Lord. He followed the Lord. And the battle plans that the Lord gave him, you can, you can see in the Civil War being used again. They're used in, in World War II, divide and conquer. And we'll see that played out in, in the weeks ahead. And, and this is the first of a four-part teaching. So this Wednesday night is the first one. Then for the next three consecutive Wednesday nights, I'll be, I'll be teaching on, on Joshua. Another thing that I think causes Joshua to kind of fall into the background a little bit is that he was not a flashy guy. He was not like David, you know, handsome and ruddy and, and a playboy and all kinds of things like that. He, he wasn't, wasn't that way. Neither, neither, neither was he a person like Solomon with all the wives, all the wisdom, all the wealth, all the show. He wasn't that. Joshua was more of a, of a plugger. He was faithful day in and day out to be obedient to God. In the school that I headed for, for 28 years, when we had graduate, graduation every year, there was a valedictorian and a salutatorian. And then every now and then, I gave a special silver cup, and I called it the Plugger's Prize. And it was for that person who accomplished the most with what he had to work with. Step by step by step, always faithful, always on time, always obedient, always a smile. 
Well, Joshua was that kind of thing. If, if Joshua was in the graduating class, I'd, I'd have to give him a plugger's prize because he was, he was right there with it. There are millions of folks today who call themselves Christians, but they're not pluggers. They're not faithful. They're not obedient. There is a dearth of Joshua's in the church today. But Joshua was there in his day and time. I want to lift up to you the fact that I said that Joshua was a bridge man, a, a link man. And, and the thing is, people change. Now, we need to understand where Joshua is. Forty years earlier, the Israelites, under the leadership of Moses, had come out of Egypt. They had been in the wilderness for 40 years. But the thing is, during those 40 years, because of their disobedience, because of their unfaithfulness, every adult, every person 20 years old or older, when they came out of Egypt, all those people had died. So the people that were there before Joshua were not the same people who walked out of Egypt. Not at all. All those people had changed. Everybody who came out of Egypt was dead except for Joshua and Caleb. Everything else was, was new. And of course, leaders change. Moses had been the, the leader for all that time, from Egypt, from the Exodus, right on through until this point. And now Joshua is dead, Moses is dead, and Joshua is, is taking his place. So the people change, leaders change, but the thing is, God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, past, present, and future. And not only does God not change, but God's purposes and His promises are intact over time. They don't change either. God, God is not happenstancy and, and whimsical in His thoughts and purposes. He's got a plan for you. He's got a plan for me. He had a plan for Joshua. He had a plan for the descendants of Abraham from the time he first approached Abraham. Come and follow me. I'll be your God. You be my people. I got a plan for you. I have a purpose in mind for you. Joshua and the people of Israel are heirs to a covenant promise that's 500 years old. And that promise was made to Abraham as he first put his feet on the land in Canaan. And God said to Abraham, he said, to you and to your offspring, I will give this land. Genesis 12, 7. A promise made. And when God makes a promise, He is indeed a promise keeper. So here we start the book of this leaders change, the transition time. God speaks to Joshua. He says, Moses, my servant is dead. Now then you, you, Joshua, you and all these people, all the survivors, all the new people born in the, in the wilderness time, all this crowd of people, approximately two million of them, the whole wilderness is littered with the bones of the people who came out of Egypt who were 20 and older. But there's been new birth in there. So you and all these two million people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I have, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. To, do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. I think for as, as God speaks to Joshua here, we hear an echo of God speaking to, to Moses at the burning bush. When he says, Moses, I want you to go down to Egypt down there. I want you to lead the people out. And Moses starts coming up with excuses. He doubts himself. How can I pull this off? This is a huge task. I've been taking care of sheep. How can I, how can I do that? And I think Joshua's speaking in that same way. Lord, how can I do this? I've been watching Moses, but Moses has been, Moses been leading the show. I've just been in the, in the wings watching here. I'm not capable of, of doing all that. And then God says, look here, I'm asking you to do it. Have, have I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. You can't do it, Joshua. That's what he said. You can't do it, Joshua. But I can. And I want to accomplish my purposes using you. I want to work in you. I want to work through you to get these people from where they are now to where I promised their forefathers they would eventually be. I want to get them into, into their land. So God promises him, what's he say? Don't be afraid, don't be discouraged. Why? Because I will be with you. See the last line? I will be with you wherever you go. Listen, friends, God is with you wherever you go. He's there. 
We're up against lots of obstacles, just like Joshua was, and people of Israel, just like God's people always have been. But the thing is, when God's people see an obstacle, what they see is an opportunity for God to reveal His strength and power. Awe and majesty comes out in the presence when we hit ourselves up against something we cannot accomplish on our own. And I, and I think that's what, where Joshua is now. He's intimidated by the challenge ahead. And God says, get a grip, Joshua. Don't be afraid. I'm going to be with you like I was with Moses. Here's how I'm going to pull it off, Joshua. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. The book of the law, the first five books of the, what, the Old Testament, the books of Moses. Moses wrote those books during the time that, that he was in the wilderness there. Joshua would have watched him write in the books. It says, keep this law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful and do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous. Then we'll get into the promised land. Then you'll be successful as a leader of the people. It hinges on your being faithful to the book of the law. You're being faithful to, to what I've said. And, and what he's saying is there, Joshua, you've got to know what's in the book. You've got to know what's in the book. You've got to read it. You've got to work with it. Now, these were, they were, these were all scrolls. And if you look at the first five books of the, of the Old Testament, they're pretty lengthy. And I suspect that, that Joshua wasn't pulling out these original scrolls to study from. I suspect that he had a copy that had been made that he could use and, and thumb through and roll to different spots and just, just get it solid in his head right there. Um, to lead God's people, he had to know God's Word. He had to be able to, to talk about it. Was it was always on your lips. And I think God is saying to him, son, you, you need to study this book. You need to know it cold. Because the people that you're working with don't. The folks who will be helping you lead, they don't know it cold. So you've got to be talking about it. It's not enough for you to have information. You've got to share information. My word will inspire them. You've got to talk about it. And before you start running your mouth, think about it. Meditate on it, see? Meditate on it day and night. In other words, here's the law. Here's my word. Here's my covenant promises. Here's who I am. Here's my character. Here's what I have done, and it's a foretaste of what I will do. I don't change this. But what you need to do is think about how my scriptures, how my word applies to your situation. That's what meditation is. How does it apply to your day and time? It doesn't change over time, but the application of it will change over time. How do you apply it? How, how, do you, how does it work in every different situation that you're going to encounter? And then above all, you've got to obey. You've got to obey it. Careful to do everything. Obedience. And if you'll do that, if you'll know my word, if you'll share my word with others, if you'll think about the application of it, just don't go willy-nilly. Apply it appropriately in a given situation. Be obedient to the word. Then what's going to happen? We're going to take the promised land. You'll be successful as a leader. Praise God. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get ready. Now, I'm not doing verse by verse by verse like I did with Jonah. I'm having to move through. This is a long book. Get ready. Get your provisions ready. Three days from now, you'll cross the Jordan right here. And you're going to take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. Joshua takes command. Moses is dead. Joshua begins to, to exercise authority and responsibility with the people. He ordered the officers of the people. All right, now they're listening to him, not to Moses. How was Moses prepared or how is Joshua prepared? How did, how did he pull that off? Well, I think in, in leadership then, as with leadership now, what, has, what, what a person has done in the past is a great foreshadowing of what they will do. You know, pe people don't change their spots. They just don't. And Joshua had been faithful in the past. 
if you read your scriptures and you, you study about the wilderness experience in there, and, and you remember that very early on the Israelites run into, into the Amalekites. And there's a big battle that takes place, and Joshua leads the battle. And remember, Moses goes up on top of the mountain, sits on a stone, he's watching, and, and he's holding his hands up. And as long as Moses has his hands up, Joshua and the, the Israelites prevail. But when he puts his hand down, then, then they start losing. So what happens? Aaron and Hur come alongside him. They hold his hands up like that, and the Israelites prevail. Well, Joshua was there. He trusted in God at that battle. He was there Mount Sinai, when Moses goes up on Mount Sinai, the Scriptures tell us that, that Joshua went with him to Mount Sinai. He went part way up the mountain, but he didn't go up to see God where Moses did. Instead, what Joshua do? He didn't go back home and take a nap. He stayed right up there on that mountain and waited for 40 days. And remember what was going on back down the mountain? Aaron was, the folks were being led astray to worship the golden calf. He's up there on the mountain. He's being faithful He's waiting. He's being obedient. Joshua shows us his courage again when Moses sends 12 spies into the land of Jericho. And they reconnoitre the land. They come back and make a report. And, and 10 of the people say, hey, we, we can't pull this off. They're giants there. The obstacles are way too great. Joshua and Caleb say, oh, yeah, we can. Because our God is bigger than the challenges that are there in that land. Joshua and Caleb lived. See. But the majority of the people agreed with those ten spies. Oh, they said, we can't pull this off. And all of them died. All of them died. See. In the last perhaps as many as three years of Moses' life, we read about Moses taking Joshua before Eleazar the high priest, and, and he's anointed for leadership. And I think what happens in that is kind of like the a bishop coadjutor. Someone comes alongside, he's going to be the heir apparent, and he studies closely for two or three years, whatever it is, before the next person departs and he takes over. We're led to believe that, that in the last few years of Moses' life, that Joshua is intent. The die is already cast, he's going to be taking his place, and he's watching carefully to what's going to be going on. Good leaders have a past history of faithfulness. They also have a specific call. Joshua has a specific call. God says, Joshua, here's what your purpose is. Here's what your plan is. Here's my vision for you. All, all good leaders have a vision of God's preferred future, and they are called to lead people into the fulfillment of God's vision. Joshua has been given a vision by God. He's been given a, Joshua, I want you to lead the people. This is, this is why I'm bringing you into leadership. This is what I've been preparing you for. This is your hour. This is your time. This is your purpose. Don't worry about it. I'm going to be with you. We're going to pull this thing off. But this is what we're going to pull off. It's my plan, not your plan. We're going to the promised land. We're not cutting back to Egypt or anywhere else. And then you've got you to have faith in God. God's plan and purpose is there for you, and it's there for me, just as it was for Joshua, just as it was for Moses at the burning bush. And sometimes it looks like more than we can possibly handle. And it is more than we can possibly handle. But it's not more than God can handle. And that's the thing. For some strange reason, God has chosen to work through you and through me. And all of our inadequacies, all of our shortcomings, God, God puts His mark on that. And I'm going to use you. I'm going to use you. And you are going to glorify me by fulfilling the purpose for which I created you. Start sending the leaders through. The people realize that, that Joshua is in charge. And the people of, of Israel answered Joshua, Joshua, we're with you. Whatever you commanded us to do, we'll do. Wherever you send us to go, we'll go. We will follow you just as we fully obeyed Moses. We will obey you. Now, if you know your scriptures, you know they didn't always obey Moses because people are, are up and down in, in our obedience and faithfulness, just like Christians today, just like you and me. You know, We have good intentions, but we sometimes slip and slide and, and, and go backwards in what we're doing. We will obey you, see, just as we obeyed Moses. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. 
In other words, we're going to follow you as long as we feel like you are following the Lord. Don't mess up here. Don't mess up. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, skip it ahead to the second chapter. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab, and, and they stayed there. It's kind of a, an echo here of Moses sending 12 spies into the, prom, into the promised land to reconnoiter, and they come back, and Joshua and Caleb believe it's possible, and the others, the others don't. He stands at 12, he, he sends two. And I suspect he meditated on that. He prayed over it for God to show him which two to, to pick. And he picked out two faithful people that weren't going to come back and say this is impossible. He picked up two people who, who trusted in the Lord. And he sends them into Jericho. Now, realize he doesn't have to send them into Jericho. He's been there before. He knows what this is all about. But he sends them. And then look at this. And they entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab. This is the first time anybody else in the book of Joshua is mentioned. God has a plan. And this plan involves Rahab. And, and indeed, this, this segment of this passage shows that God has been, been working on Rahab for a long time. This isn't an accident that they're going there. They have specific instructions to go there. Rahab. She was a, a Gentile. All the people that are there following Joshua, all of those folks are Hebrew people. She's not like them. She's a Gentile. She's an Amorite. In other words, she's, she's a part of a tribe of people who are bloodthirsty killers. They worship the god Molech. They sacrifice children to him. They're idol worshipers. They're, they're the other end of the spectrum from where the Hebrew people are. That's the, that's the essence of it. She's not an heir to the covenant. They are. She's, she's way out there. She's worshiping idols. They don't, see? And she's a prostitute. She's an immoral person. She's not following God's laws. I mean, she, she is the, the atypical person. She, she's a sinner above all sinners. Isn't that amazing? And yet that's, that's where they're sent. The spies come in and and they, the king finds out, the king of the Amorites there in and, and Jericho is his capital city and finds out and he comes looking for them. She hides the spies and they're up on her rooftop. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to him, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are, are melting with fear. Now, how does she know what is going on? Well, remember what she is? She's a prostitute. And she would have had lots of people who are, are men, who are traitors, working with caravans, coming through from Egypt up to Jericho, headed up toward Jerusalem. And they'd be passing through there. And they would be talking to each other, telling stories. Man, did you, did you hear about those plagues in Egypt? Here we hear, did you hear about the Red Sea being part you hear about all those people coming to, to battle with the Amalekites? And, and they're just knocking these people off right and left. And they're headed, they're headed toward Canaan. Now, they're not there. But it's like this herd of two million locusts are coming, and they're devouring everything in their way. And, and Rahab's on the other side of the river. And what she's telling the spies is, fellas, we, we heard what's, we've heard that, Lord, y'all are going to get this land. We, do, we figured it all out. A great fear is falling. We know that we are in the bullseye for the people of Israel. Everybody who lives in this country is, is melting of fear. See, they heard about all of it. But the thing, the thing about it is, God is using what Rahab is hearing. She's hearing, but what she's hearing is making a difference in what she's believing. Now then, 
please swear to me by the Lord. This is Rahab speaking to the spies. Please swear to me by the Lord that you'll show kindness to my family. We know you're coming. We know you're going to destroy the city. I'm saving your life. I want you to do for me what I'm doing for you. Show kindness to my family because I've shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you'll save us from death. Doesn't mention a husband. I suspect that's not what you would would find uh, that a prostitute would have. But she's a prostitute with that proverbial heart of gold. She cares about her family members. And that's what she's asking for. Give me a sign. Give me a sign. When you come to destroy the city, I want you to spare my family like I have spared you. This oath you made us swear. They promised to do it. This oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. Unless you brought your father and mother and your brothers and all your family into your house. In other words, we want you to hang this scarlet cord out of your window. Probably it was the same cord that they, that they got on to, to shimmy down the wall to take off and, and hide. Because she tells the king's men that, that they've gone. They've gone. They're not, they're not here. Well, they were hiding on the rooftop, and then she lets them over in the nighttime, and they, and they take off. But what they're saying is, okay, we'll keep the oath. We will not kill your family members. There could be death everywhere. We'll spare you. But you've got to have all of them in your house. Anybody that's missing, too bad. You've got to have them all in your house, and you have to have this cord hanging out your window so we'll know which house is yours. Now, Rahab obviously lived in the walls of Jericho. When she'd lowered the spies out, they were outside the walls. The walls of Jericho, about 16 feet wide. Many people lived in there, and they had windows out. Huge walls. So there we have it. I think about the, the Samaritan woman when I read about this. And the line that, the line that I use right here is, so we left, Jesus is, is up there baptizing, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So Jesus left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. Now, if you know, you know your geography over there. Galilee's in the north, Samaria's in the middle, and Judea is in the south. Jesus is a Jewish rabbi. The faithful Jewish people detested the Samaritans. They would be like the Amorites. They saw them as, as not believers in the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So the faithful Jews wouldn't walk through Samaria. They wouldn't do that. They would cut over to the Jordan River and they would walk up the Jordan River in the Jordan River Valley and then head west again into the Galilee. But here's a strange phrase stuck in there. Jesus had to go through Samaria. What's in Samaria? The Samaritan woman. An outcast like Rahab. A person that's very immoral. She's had five husbands. She's living with somebody else. She has as checkered a past as there possibly could be. She's not accepted <coughs> where she is. And you have this amazing piece of, of grace there where Jesus encounters the Samaritan woman. And, and here's the thing. It was part of God's plan. Jesus had to go there. Why? To fulfill God's purposes for him. And we see that thing with, with Rahab. Joshua didn't have to spend, send spies to Jericho. He'd reconnoitered that whole thing 38 years before that. He knew what was there. He knew what the people were thinking about there in Jericho because he was speaking to the people one of the caravans too. He knew the fear and trepidation that was up there for him. But he had to go there because God had plans for Rahab. And Rahab was a part of his much bigger, bigger picture. It's this thing about, about grace. Paul writes to Timothy. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He, he, in essence, is saying, I'm the worst of sinners, and he saved me. That God's ultimate purpose is to redeem the world, to save sinners. Well, God's purpose was, was back there in the time of Abraham and Isaac. It didn't change. 
Didn't change. He's working on the same thing down here in, in Romans. Consequently, faith comes from hearing. Isn't that being played out in Rahab's life? She was hearing what God was doing. She heard the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. Now, of course, she lives way before Christ. And, of course, the, the Samaritan woman does not know that Jesus is the Messiah. <clears throat> That's not something that she's heard. But God reveals it to her. By faith, the prostitute Rahab. This is in chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews. It's called the chapter of, of heroes. Rahab's right there. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. In the same way, this is in the book of James, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did? In the same way, as talking about Abraham, his obedience was considered by God as righteousness. In the same way, wasn't even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a, in a different direction? You know, faith without action is nothing. Faith without works is dead, we're told in Scripture. Many of us claim to be faithful people, but you can't tell it from the way that, that we act. We act as if we are the Amorites. Rahab put her life on the line. Now, she's living in this, in this Gentile, pagan-worshiping town. <coughs> Lots of people there. And she's talking to people who have an entirely different faith. And if she's found out, she's going to be killed. They don't play there. She's going to be killed, and probably everybody related to her, all of them are going to be dead. She puts her life on the line. And then, then she has this, this idea that, you know, I'm not who I'm supposed to be. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm like a pilgrim in a foreign land. These people aren't, aren't really my people. I, I'm better than this. I don't, I don't know what word she would have, have got in that. But there's this thing of, of here's who I am, but somehow or another that's not who I'm supposed to be. And I've got, got to turn the page. I have to shift gears. I have to change myself. I've got to change the people that I'm around. All that's got to go different. And then here God has worked through what she has heard and created a, the seeds of faith in her heart. And she begins to identify as she speaks to the, to the spies. And it's going to be saved by that. Begins to identify with, with the Jewish people. And what's amazing to me is God's grace has gone before. And as, as she identifies, the city is destroyed and Rahab goes and, to be with, with the Hebrew people. And they receive her. They accept her in. Now, they don't know what, what Rahab's role in God's plan is. None of us know what our, how that exact puzzle piece we have in God's plan. That's, that'll be revealed way down the line somewhere. And folks will look back and say, whoa, I see how God used Chuck. Or I see how God used Susie over here. Or Fred or whatever. I see the puzzle piece that he was, was fulfilling. Because now I see more of the, pic, the picture of the puzzle on the box top. Now I see some of that. Now, we know looking back through history at Rahab that Rahab is accepted into the Hebrew people, that she marries a, a Hebrew man named, named Salmon, that together they, they have a son. His name is Boaz. Boaz marries Ruth, who's another outsider. It's not immoral like Rahab was, but she's non-Hebrew. Boaz marries Ruth. <clears throat> they have a son named, named Obed. And then Obed has a son named Jesse, and of course Jesse is going to be the father of David, the king of Israel. And of course, ultimately you run that history down, and, and there's Jesus. Read the, read the genealogies and the Gospels, and, and you see Rahab right there. You see Ruth right there. Praise God. Here's the point I want us to make, <coughs> that we are that we are Rahab. Aren't we supposed to be Christians? And aren't we finding ourselves living in a, amongst an alien people? We're called to be different than them. Aren't we sinners just like, just like she was? Sure. 
And this idea that she hangs the scarlet cord out of her window, and that's the sign that will spare her life. God's people are not going to kill her. That scarlet cord just, just echoes through scriptures in all kinds of ways. When, when I see that, I, I think first about the, the Passover. When the Israelites are, are there in Egypt, and God says the angel of death is going to pass over the land, you need to, every family get together, slaughter a lamb, put the blood on the doorpost and lintels of your house. And if that blood is there, you will be saved. Saved by the blood of the Lamb. I see that scarlet cord again at Calvary as Jesus' blood is, is shed for you and me. That the power of that blood is to wash away the penalty for our sins. The wages of sin is death, but the blood is the doorway to life. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. And the thing about it is, if we think about the scarlet cord Rahab puts down, all those folks who were not saved by the scarlet cord, all of them died. Everybody there in Jericho dies, except for Rahab and her family. I think we live in a culture we're sinners. We have a choice. Are we going to be saved by the blood or, or not? And those who are not are going to perish. That's clear in the Scriptures, isn't it? Let's move on. They're there. They're preparing to... They're there in the floodplains on the... They would be on the eastern side of, of the Jordan River... They're, they're all excited about it. Now, now think about this. They've been in the wilderness for 40 years. All during that time, they've been hearing talk about the promised land. We are going somewhere. We're, we're wandering around. Doesn't seem like we're going anywhere. All these people are dying, but there's a promised land. God has a purpose. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. But you're waiting, and you're waiting, and you're waiting, and you're eating manna every day, and it's, it's hot, and there's nothing pleasant about it. So you have your mind hooked into this idea of, of there's something coming. To me, it's, their attitude might well have been like a child at Christmas time. And you, you're counting it down. You're waiting. Oh, I can't wait till Christmas morning and presents under the tree and, and all that. You're fired up. You're excited, see? Except it's been the night before Christmas for 40 years for them. And, and then, they, then they get there. And whoa, the Jordan's at flood stage during the harvest. It's in the springtime of the year. Now, we think of harvest in the fall, but, but over there, and this is in the southern part of, of Canaan, the southern part of, of the promised land area there, they would be harvesting barley and, and a winter wheat crop at this time. This would be like, like March, mid-March, something like that. And it says the, the river, the Jordan River is flooding. And why is that? Because the Jordan River has its genesis up north in the snows on Mount Hermon. And in the, as springtime comes, that snow starts to melt. And it comes down Mount Hermon into all those little tributaries that feed into the Jordan. And the Jordan's picking up speed, picking up speed. Water, the volume of water is going. And if you, if you remember a little bit about the geography over there, if we say that, <clears throat> that this aisle right here is the, is the Jordan River, the mountains, the Jordanian mountains on this side, the central highlands of, of Israel are over here. Um, that's east, that's west, that's south. And as that Jordan River comes down, the topography, the land is dropping from the highest place in Israel, Mount Hermon, to the lowest place, the Dead Sea. And the, the farther it goes, the faster it goes, and the more it rumbles. Ever seen pictures of the Colorado River? And that thing is churning and going, and, and you can see rocks and dirt and everything else being moved along. Now, it's cut a swath in those mountains, so it's bounded. Well, in the same way, the Jordan River has a floodplain that's been cut away. This is a river, a great rift valley caused by an earthquake umpteen years ago. But anyway, the, the river is rolling, and not, is it, not only is it rolling, but it's going wider. It has flooded the area. 
So the people, it's like Christmas morning comes and look, and, and there it is. There's the promised land over there. I can see it off in the distance. But whoa, what is this thing? That'd be like coming down Christmas morning, like when I was a, a child with, with my sisters. You know, you'd come on Christmas morning, and you'd see the presents right there. But then that voice would go in your head, we've got to wait on mom and dad to get up. And that became a, a chore. It's so close. You, could, you can grab the packages, but you've got to wait. So here it is. They come. The Jordan River is flooded. Major obstacle. How are we going to pull this off? See? Again, with God, all things are possible. And the, what happens, just as the book says, it's flooded, yet as soon as the priest who carried the, who carried the ark reached the Jordan, and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped. Now, what had to happen is the, the priest had to make a statement of faith. God didn't stop the water and create dry, dry ground for the water. He didn't do that until they took a step of faith, and the priest put their foot in the water. Then what happened? Boom. The water in the north stopped coming down. The book says it just heaped up. The waters in the south kept on flowing down to the, down to the Dead Sea. Now, this is, you ought to remind you some of the crossing of the Red Sea when Moses led the people there. The water split, and it piled up on both sides, and they walked through the middle. Well, here we are now, and they're going to cross the Jordan River. Our, the priest put their foot in the water. It stops. The water coming down from the north stops and piles up. On the south goes down, and the whole thing clears up for them. The water from upstream stopped flowing. Then the priest who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord stepped into the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while Israel passed by. So, so here we are. The, they've got the ark of the covenant. They step out. They stand in the middle of the riverbed of the Jordan River, and the people come in it all around them. They, they stay there with that ark until everybody's crossed over. Now, this, this would have two million people. It's, this is not a 10-minute deal here. They'd have been standing there a long time to get that many people across. And they're going to the other side. They stopped in the middle for it until the whole nation had completed. Let's look a minute at the Ark of the Covenant. This, the Ark is it's huge in significance, but it really was, was just a small box. It was made of a acacia wood, three feet nine inches long. So that's just a little bit longer than my arm. And then it was two feet, three inches wide and high. So it's a, it's a small box. Huge significance. It's a small box. It's covered with gold all around the outside and the inside. And the top of the box, the lid, is made out of solid gold. And if you, if you look at it here, this is all gold. These are the rods that are in rings, and the priest would be one down here, one down here, there and there. They'd be carrying it. They couldn't touch the ark itself. All gold up here. And these two gold figures here represent angels. And the people believed that God was present between the wings of the cherubim. I'll meet with you. You know, there's a praise song about that. Between the wings of the cherubim, I will meet with you that God dwelled between, or was present between the wings of the cherubim, not sitting on the top, but present between the wings. And this top here was made solid of solid gold, and that was called the mercy seat. And what was in the Ark of the Covenant? The Ten Commandments, the tablets of stone that God had given to Moses. They're in there. So, so what, we, what we see being, being played out here is, is God is... God is present with them. They're walking into the river. Now, the Ark of the Covenant didn't just show up when they got to the Jordan River. That was there for 38 years in the wilderness. They never saw it. It was always covered with a veil because you're not supposed to see God's presence. So it was always covered with a veil. It was in the middle of the tabernacle that they followed all the way through. God led them all the way through the wilderness. It was time to move. They moved, and the Ark led them. Time to stop? They stopped. Pillar of fire in the, at nighttime and a cloud in the daytime showed God's presence there. But, 
but what, what we have here is this represents God's power and, and, and God's leadership. They follow the Lord. This is where the Lord is present. They follow the Lord. It also represents God's power, His power. He's the same God who opened the Red Sea for the Israelites. Power, power. But He's also holy. The commandments there, and we're sinners, and we, you know, how to, we. He is so holy, we can't, we can't come into His presence. We can't do that. How do, how do we, how do we get there? He's holy. The law is here. He's just. You, you break the law, and you're going to pay for it. See, except for the fact that, that God's merciful. This is called the mercy seat, between God, and the law is God's mercy. That was played out. The Ark of the Covenant was in the tabernacle in the temple, and, and one day a year, the Day of Atonement, the high priest would sacrifice a lamb, pray over the lamb, symbolically put the sins of the people on the lamb, sacrifice the lamb, take the blood, and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. Scarlet cord again, isn't it? Scarlet cord again sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, and that that would wash away the penalty for their sins. Amazing the symbolism in, in all of that. Amazing. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan River, so now they're on the other side. When the whole nation had finished crossing, the Lord said to Joshua, the ark's still in the middle, riverbed still dry. Choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing. That right there, everything's dry. The riverbed is, is covered with these big old stones. I want you to go out there. Don't pick up a pebble now. Pick up a, a big stone, a significant stone, biggest thing you can carry. I want 12 of them from right where the priests are standing and carry them over with you. Take them over with you and put them down at the place where you're going to stay tonight. That place where they're going to stay tonight is called Gilgal, G-I-L-G-A-L-L. Now, as we look at, at this crossing part, as this, this segment that I'm going to work with here in the fourth chapter, there's, there's three things we're going to be looking at. The crossing itself, I've gone through that part, and now we're going to look at this memorial. That's the second big factor that's going to happen here. And then the next is going to be the consecration of the people. God said, I want you to get the stones. Set them down at this place. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the 12 stones they had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what, what do these stones mean? Tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on, on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what He had done to the Red Sea when He dried it up before us until we had, had crossed over it. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth, in other words, He piled them up and made this memorial. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful so that you might always fear the Lord. Now, we need to understand that, that Gilgal will become the basis, kind of like the base camp for the Israelites as they're working in this region of the Promised Land. They'll keep coming back to that place. And it's not going to be smooth sailing for them. This is going to be a tremendous adjustment for the people. They're going to get discouraged. And so Joshua has this memorial set up there at Gilgal, they're going to be coming back. And I think the first reason that they have that there is that when they come back, if they come back discouraged, they say, you know, it was a hard day today, but God's with us. He's the same God that's with us today when we caught hell as He was when we parted the, the Jordan River. God is with us. It was, becomes a source of encouragement for the people. I think it's also important to see that it wasn't just about the people. 
of Israel. They see that monument there. There are a lot of folks traveling through that valley. The Israelites are, this is not an uninhabited land, as I talked about the caravan routes and all the rest of it. Um, he did so that all the peoples of the earth. So there's a purpose for building that memorial that's there for the Israelites. It's there for the Israelites in the present. Um, it's there for in the, in the present and in the future. They're going to be working to con conquer the, and occupy the promised land. They're going to get discouraged. They need a source of encouragement. But also, it's there for their descendants who didn't see the Jordan River being parted. They hadn't seen that, that great miracle. In future generations, bring your children here. And use this as, as a reminder for you to tell them the stories. Because if you don't tell them the stories, nobody in the promised land is going to tell them to them. And we have a responsibility that with our own children, with our own families and our grandchildren. We have to tell them the stories. What's that old song? Tell, tell me that old, old story. You know? Well, that's what it is. This is going to be an old, old story one day. And future generations will be coming by there and they'll, they'll ask, what, what's, this, what's the stones all about here? Anytime I look at this passage, I, I always think about the cemeteries where people are buried. I think about the columbarium right outside of of the historic campus over there on the bluff. And every, every week that I'm on the campus over there, I'll take time to walk around that columbarium. And what's out there? Those little brass plaques. Well, that's kind of like the pile of stones. And as I look at the brass plaques, there's a name on there. And it helps me to remember the people. And as I remember the people, I see their faces. I see the different ways we interacted with each other. And it's it just reminds me of God's power and presence and provision through those people into my life and the responsibilities that I have for others. So it's about the people in the present. It's about those who are going to come after it. But it's more than that. Everybody. Everybody. I think I went the wrong way. Everybody needs to know. All the people who do not believe in God. All the people need to know about God's power about his provision for the people of Israel. They need to know that God is present in the world now. Just as he was present when they crossed over the Jordan River, he is present in the world now, and he will be present in the future. So we have the, the two memorials. Now, with all the Amorite kings west of Jordan and all the Canaanite kings, now, now think about the picture here. You're in the Jordan River Valley. You're now on the Canaan, the promised land side of the valley. The train heads up sharply. And Central Highlands, you've got all these tribes of people up there who hate your guts. And they all know you're coming, and you're coming to get them. And now the herd of locusts has moved on their side of the river. They thought they had some safety there because the Jordan River was flooding. They don't be able to get across that. Well, now God has parted the way there, and now they're shaking in their boots. He's coming. They're coming. The, Ca the Canaanite kings along the coast heard. So it wasn't just the ones in the central highlands, all over by the Mediterranean. They'd heard too how the Lord had, had man, if he, if he dried up the, Red, uh, the Jordan River, think what their God can do to us. Their hearts melted in fear. They no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. They're shaken in their boots. Now what's, what's amazing to me is that that's the mindset of the enemy. You just crossed over. You've got all your troops there. Wouldn't you think that now is the time to attack? Man, they're scared to death. This would be a piece of cake. But, but what happens is God says, no, no. I want you to stop. I want you to stop for three days. Because see, this victory is not, not going to be about the fact that, they, that they're scared to death. It's about me. And it's about you. And it's about my relationship with you. We need to stop and everybody get on the same page here. We need to get in, get in touch with who we are as God's people and our purpose in life individually and corporately. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites. Circumcision had not been done in the wilderness. Remember, God's people were, were disobedient. That whole thing of the, 
where it's a golden calf, just made this huge rift between God and the people. They weren't circumcised. They weren't keeping the covenants. The first circumcision was Abraham. And, and that circumcision was a, was a sign of the fact that circumcised people were heirs to God's covenant promises made to Abraham. The promises made to Abraham are what got them there to, to, to the foot of, of where Jericho is going to be. It's that same string of promises. And what God wants now is, all right, let's stop. I want you to renew your covenant with me. I'll be your God, same covenant I have with Abraham. I'll be your God, you be my people. All the men circumcised. Now, we do circumcision today when, when the babies are, are teensy. These are grown men. You know, you got guys 40 years old, 50 years old. Some will be 60 years old because anybody under 20 was still alive. So you could have people 55, 60 years old. Circumcision for an adult male is, is debilitating for a period of days. And that's what happens. Here the enemy is, is weak. They're scared, shivering. And what happens? God says, let's take time out here. Let's circumcise ourselves. It's a short-term commitment that has a long-term value. You need to think about who you are and who I am and what our relationship is. Circumcision would be like, kind of like baptism. That would be, I guess, the modern equivalent of that. You know, when we're baptized, we're welcome into the family of God. Well, that's what circumcision was. It was marked. You were marked as a member of God's covenant community. Well, our covenant is through Jesus Christ right now. And we're baptized. We're marked not by a knife, but we're marked with the sign of the cross on our foreheads. And as we're marked with that sign of the cross, we are sealed as Christ owned forever, just as surely as the circumcision was a forever sign of the relationship with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with the people. And all the people came out, had been circumcised. But all the people born in the wilderness during the journey from Egypt had not. The people that came out, they'd been circumcised. The, the children, less than 20 years old, less than 20 years old, they had been circumcised when they were eight days old, when they were little people. That was part of the Abraham covenant. So those ones who were younger than 20, when they came out, they'd been circumcised. But everybody else born there, everybody was there. Everybody had to be, be circumcised. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. Circumcision of the Passover, the two major ceremonies, memorials of the Hebrew people. Baptism and the Lord's Supper, the two sacraments that are most important for Christian people. On the evening of the 14th day, camped at Gilgal, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The Passover is always in the springtime of the year. Remember the harvest was, was there. It was harvest time. It was flooding. The snows were melting. It was time. It was a new time of year. For us, Easter is always in the springtime. Easter is the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox, March 21st. That's how you find that. Well, the Passovers work the same way in Hebrew faith, different words. But it's in the springtime of the year always, sometimes coincides with, with Easter. The Israelites celebrated the Passover. They remembered it was a memorial. We celebrate communion. We remember what Jesus did at the Last Supper as a preface to, to the cross and the resurrection. They're remembering the Passover in Egypt. And remember how they ate that Passover in Egypt? With their loins girded up, they're ready for action. The Passover came, the death angel passed by, and they were hitting the road, ready for action. That's a part of the Passover meal. It ought to be a part of the way we look at, at baptism and, and the Lord's Supper, that it's a call to remember, and at the same time, it's a call to action. The Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land. Now, what they've been manna and quail and all that in the wilderness for 40 years. Now, we've celebrated the Passover. God has delivered them 
and they eaten now of the produce of the land. Remember, it's harvest time. Unleavened bread, roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites. But that year, they ate the produce of Canaan. They've arrived. They're there. God has provided for them. He provided what they needed in the wilderness. They're sick and tired of it, but he provided it and it kept them alive. And now, remember what, how they described what they were looking forward to? A land flowing with milk and honey. A land in which all of our desires can be fulfilled. A land in which we'll grow fat and happy. That idea of, of wonderment. And now they're there. And God shows them, man, we don't need the man anymore. You're out of the land of milk and honey. I've provided for you. Thank you for being faithful. We need to remember what God does for us. And I think that's something we, we've got the pile of stones at Gilgal. And they're there around the pile of stones celebrating the Passover. And the pile of stones reminds them of what God has done and that he's present with them and he's going to do more for them. And they celebrate the Passover, another reminder of, of what God has done. But it, it reinforces that what God has done, he is doing. He provided freedom for the people getting out of, out of Egypt. He provided a land for the people. He fulfilled the promises that he'd made to, to their forefather Abraham 500 years later. But he kept his word, see. He kept his word. And that as God had done in the past, as God was doing for them right now, they, sh they should have been fired up. Look at what our heritage is. Look at what can come. And it's the same way with us, with, with baptism, with the communion. We're reminded of what God has done, not as an event in history, but as a precursor to God is doing now. He is doing now. And he will do in the future, not just for us, but for, for future generations. This whole idea of, of stopping. The world would have said, man, you need to attack right now. But see, the world's ways are not God's ways. And what's, what's important for the Lord is that, you know, what we do is important. It's important that we, make, that we take the promised land. That's part of my purpose and plan. What God has a, a purpose for you. It's important that you fulfill that. But the way you fulfill it is, is to be who God created you to be. And here God stops them. They're all ready to go, to go and attack. They're, they're eating the barley and the grain and, and the, all the foodstuffs in this new place. They are fired up there among the palm trees and, and that Jordan River Valley Plain. Life is good, see. Life is good. But God says, no, we need to stop right here now. Because it's not about what you do. It's about who you are. We need to remember. We need to get circumcised. You're part of a covenant community. I've made promises to you. You have made promises to me. Let's remember that relationship, who's God and, and who's not. Let's remember that. Let's remember the people in Egypt who believed. Because if you believe like you do, like they did, then you will be delivered from slavery to sin. It's important what we do here in the 21st century, just, just like them 3,000 years ago. It's important what we do, but, but who we are is most important. Who are you as a child of God? See? And the thing is, if you, if you understand who you are and God's covenant promises, then, then your fears will, will not overshadow you. You won't be like Joshua at the first start or Moses at the first start. We said, no, be courageous. Be, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Lots of folks these days have, have fears. Maybe, maybe you're one of them. I want to close with a, a song that Cross Point Band did a, a while back. It wasn't just a Cross Point Band. It was a special worship time that, that we had. And, and it speaks in, into those, those fears. I pray you'll enjoy it. mentioned fear in the beginning of the of the service and this song is directly about that Stacking up the years I 
just been trading punches with the enemy. I built myself a double thick stone tower, lies higher than the eye can see, but trapped in my flesh and bone. Crying out to you, Lord, I'm desperate. Oh, come rattle these cages and set me free. All of my feet like Jericho walls gotta come down, come down. All of my feet like Jericho walls gotta come down, come down. Oh Lord, my prison times are ruined when your love moves in. All of my feet like Jericho walls gotta come down, come down. Was crashing through the pride and the blame Cutting straight to the heart of me Long before I ever called your name You were fighting for my victory But carved in your flesh and bone The wounds that have set my soul forgive me Oh, now I feel this darkness trembling Cause all of my feet like Jericho oh, Gotta come down, come down My feet Jericho, about to come down, come down, oh Lord. My prison turns to ruin, no love moves in. All of my feet like Jericho, about to come down, come down. Build me from the ground up. All I wanna see is you. Terrify the lies with the truth. Well, my feet like Jericho gotta come down, come down. All of my feet like Jericho gotta come down, come down. Oh, my prison turns to ruin. And let them come down, take my fears away. Stop me if you've heard this before, but I have a fear of letting my true self show in front of people. Y'all feel that sometimes? Because I don't think I'm good enough. You know what that feels like? It's not great. It's a, it's a fear that is persistent and pervasive in our society for so many reasons. The biggest one being that we are judged constantly, or at least we feel like we are. Mm. That ain't fair. That's what I'm tearing down. Cause I've been made a new creation a long time ago. Y'all have too. It says right there in the book. Fear not, as Jason Laporte says. God says that all the time. In the Old Testament, fear not. Because we are full of it. We are so full of fear. Oh, it's so pervasive in us. And it's hard to get rid of.
Let's sing that chorus again. Praise God. Praise God. All my fears got to come tumbling down just like those Jericho walls. Well, next week we're going to get up to Jericho. But I want you to be thinking about the fact that you have fears now and, and the people of Israel, even though they know God is with them, the Ark of the Covenant is there, they've done the memorials, that, that they're just like you and me. Jericho is the biggest thing they've ever seen. High walls. How in the world are we going to pull this off? And what happens is that fear starts creeping in, starts creeping in, and, and down at the top. Up at the top, the people up there are fearful. At the bottom, the people are, are starting to get a little fearful too because our trust in the Lord fades. I pray that in the week ahead, your, your trust in the Lord will not fail, that He's there with you in a mighty, mighty way, and that your fears will come tumbling down. I pray too that, that you'll be with me next Wednesday evening as we'll go up the, up the highlands and we'll take a shot at at Jericho and, and move on from there. And all that we do here, know that God loves you, and, and I love you as well.